Hi there. How are you doing today? Namaste. Good morning. Afternoon. Wherever you are. My name is Vishnu Dutt and I work as a network architect in Cisco. The session is going to be uh, really interesting. And uh, why? Uh, let me explain that to you. So first, let's discuss about the agenda of this session. Uh, yesterday, we discussed some of the challenges which we find in legacy enterprise. And now today we are going to discuss how we are going to solve them using SD-WAN, right? We are not going into much nitty gritty of how SD-WAN is actually solving these challenges because this is what we are going to learn in remaining sessions, right? So no com complex terminology, nothing. We are just going to discuss how SD-WAN is solving this problem. That is it, right? Now, to understand any technology, there, there are two ways, right? I can I can present you a diagram of where all we manage, we smart, we ages are there, right? And now we try to understand everything. But I really think that is going to be very boring. So what we are going to learn, what how we are going to learn SD-WAN is that we try to think SD-WAN is a big puzzle, right? We will divide that big puzzle into separate or smaller puzzles, right? Or small pieces. We will understand those smaller pieces and then combine them back for a complete solution picture, right? So that is why I have divided the complete SD-WAN solution in, uh, on a broader scale uh, where we have, uh, or you can say I have divided it into three parts. We need to understand, we need to have firm understanding of control and data plane. I know you guys are thinking that uh, everybody knows it, right? But believe me, uh, I want to repeat it, uh, and you will find something interesting out of control plane and data plane. Can we separate them? Uh, uh, and yes, we can. And that is why we are, that is, that is basically actually uh, what SD-WAN is doing, right? So consider SD-WAN as, uh, as a big puzzle. We, we, we have divided that into three parts, control plane, data plane, then uh, basically some part of routing and everybody of uh, everyone is comfortable with next stop concept right because if we want to send a packet towards a uh, towards a router we want to set an, its next hop right or when we send a route from one router to another there is a next hop parameter always associated with that route but is this that simple I would say, yes, it is simple, but I find several people have problem understanding this concept of next stop because BGP treats it uh, slightly differently as compared to other interior gateway protocols like IGP and uh, like IGP, like EIGRP or OSPF. So as this uh, session is for everyone, we will be going deeper uh, to understand what actually next stop is and how we can tweak it and believe me, SD-WAN is exactly doing this for uh, for its various policies, right? So we will understand this in plain language, plain terms, and then later uh, we will associate uh, this with SD-WAN. The third thing is understanding of tunnel. Whether it's IPsec, DTLS, TLS, we are going to discuss it in detail, right? So we will learn control plane, data plane, uh, then routing, especially from the point of view of next hop and at last tunneling. Okay, we will combine them and we will get the entire solution, which is your SD-WAN, right? And believe me, this is the solution. Although I'm not saying that this is a complete solution because we have some of the concepts like templates, uh, direct internet connectivity, then uh, centralized policies in SD-WAN which you can get to know once you have solid understanding of these three things. Once you have solid understanding of how actually SD-WAN is sending packets from one side to another side, which is the goal of this, uh, this thing, right? We have explained SD-WAN, we have explained WAN, we have explained, we have understood what are the current problems with WAN, and now we are trying to solve it with SD-WAN. And then eventually we will be combining all these different pieces together to come up with the SD-WAN solution. So this is going to be the agenda. Last 10 minutes are going to be very crucial uh, uh, to understand this because in last 10 minutes, we are going to combine all the learning, right? We are going to combine to come up with a uh, complete solution. So with that, let's start uh, the first point of the agenda, which is how SD-WAN is solving uh, the current problems.
right which which are faced by many uh, enterprises so here you go uh, i would like to start uh, uh, with uh, with this deployment and management challenges first because we have already discussed application performance and how we can solve them right but uh, at last we will be discussing that also so with respect to this deployment challenge right i mentioned that when we deploy new sites here only i have shown three sites but there might be enterprises which is having more than 800 to 1000 different uh, uh, greater than 800 to 1000 uh, branches right and in that case if a particular branch take one day then you can assume that uh, uh, basically to deploy all the branches how much time it is going to take although you can do it parallelly but still that time is really really uh, great so here with this solution with this as given solution this complete process can be automated what you need to do you need to just put a as given device in your new branch which is say branch x and connect it to internet or mpls and you are good to go whatever the configuration need to be on this device right it should get it from as given router what are the configuration policies everything will be automatically uh, pushed by the uh, as given routers as given controllers to be precise and this site is going to be up and running and that is it so you can deploy your many sites parallelly within 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 uh, within minutes instead of days right so as given solve deployment challenge this way now management challenge if we talk about management challenge what if i if i say that all of your wan circuits all of your wan routers right can be managed from a single place you can see the performance of all those links from a single place there is a single pane of glass where you can go and set your policies if this link is not performing well just just move to this link right and this central uh, central controller basically is sending all the information to this route so that the routing table can be changed okay so one single pane of glass in case of sd wan for your complete wan architecture right although i am not saying that these these are uh, these are not uh, these are the these are this is not the case with current legacy enterprise Uh, many enterprise has built their own application their own automation to all these things but believe me uh, the way sd wan is doing it it's really great and we will get to know when we go deeper when we go and understand templates when we go and understand the working how actually we manage work okay uh, considering security uh, considering security and internet access uh, in last session we discussed that uh this branch which is only connected to internet has to go to data center so that it can be scrubbed again firewall rules to access the internet but this guy doesn't need to do that right and and we can have firewall locally but which is a which is a totally cost per solution so what how is even securing uh, the direct internet access is that all the functionalities almost everything whatever this firewall can do could be done by this device which is the sd wan device i am not taking the name of this device because we will discuss the terminology later for now for us everything is sd wan device which is doing the sd wan operation okay so here if this device uh, if i say whatever the functionality provided by firewall if you can have the same kind of functionality here your direct connectivity to internet uh, security problem is solved right so uh, these two problems can also be managed by sd wan pretty significantly pretty, uh, pretty easy now consider these two things application application performance and cloud connectivity right so as i mentioned application performance means you should be getting what application requirements are so some applications have strict requirement in terms of packet loss jitter and uh, latency right and if those conditions are not met you will lose the performance of that application as a user right so suppose right now on this link on this mpls think everything is fine everything is under control no packet loss no delay no jitter and you can specify the value for all these things and suddenly 
this link goes down or this link has uh, start showing 50% packet loss or 20% packet loss right so it is the responsibility of sd wan solution to move your application traffic from this guy to this guy toward this link right and it is able to do so because uh, because everything is centrally controlled this controller knows exactly what is going what is happening in your wan this is as simple as that but you need to define those parameters that yes if this link shows 6% packet loss and this millisecond uh, latency i would like to move to the other link and it doesn't matter whether this link is internet or not okay so this is good we can solve the application performance through sdn sorry through sdwan now at last cloud connectivity right uh, currently you can see that cloud can be reachable directly from the uh from the uh branches right or it can go to the data center and then come back to the cloud which is not an optimal path right but still i would say wouldn't it be better if we have placed one sd wan router here also so that everything means the cloud is also part of my wan and i can directly go and consume these applications in cloud right the cloud connectivity multi cloud connectivity can also be done using sd wan and don't worry we will be going uh, into deeper of how basically this cloud connectivity multi cloud connectivity security internet access is going to be uh, uh, deployed by sd wan and you will learn to know the details of everything in upcoming session so uh, if you have any questions please do pose them and i will take them uh, once the session is over i will be here for next 15 minutes after this session is over so uh, do not worry now as i said that yes you all know now that sd wan has the capabilities to solve all the existing issues which we find in legacy environments but now it is time to check uh, basically how this solution is built right so as i mentioned i have divided this complete solution into three different pieces we will try to understand them first so the first piece was control plane and data plane let's try to understand what exactly control plane and data plane is so here you go although router is always uh, represented by a circle but because i need to put some more information into this so let's uh, for now assume this square box this rectangular box is uh, is the router okay this is the complete router so i have divided this router into two parts the top one which says processor or the route processor and the below one which says routing table right so actually how things work so to understand this let's take an example of two routers we have two routers r1 and r2 and it has a specific subnet say x dot x dot x dot x here at its lan side and then basically it is connected to r2 also which is also its lan side and here we have y dot y dot y dot y everything is working fine you come here you run the ospf protocol out of it right if you run ospf protocol what happens this router will start advertising x dot x to r2 and r2 will start advertising y dot y towards r1 it is simple plain routing right but how r1 is going to advertise uh, the in this information if you are running ospf it is lss right so it means that r1 is sending some lss to r2 and r2 is sending some information to r1 if you do not know ospf that is perfectly fine but this is how the information is exchanged between r1 and r2 okay so here we have we have run ospf and uh, in ospf basically we are exchanging information through lsa in on other routing protocol we have some different mechanisms of sharing this information right so if say r1 sends a particular information or lsa towards r2 which part of the router is going to process it right because this has some meaningful information which should be processed at priority so this is exactly uh, where processor comes into picture all the lsa 
is going to be read by processor and it forms a meaningful information out of it and forms a routing table right exactly what this routing table contains if i write down so this routing table contains that if you want to and suppose this is routing table for router r1 this one right this will say to reach y dot y dot y dot y you need to go out of fa0 slash 1 suppose this interface is 0 slash 1 very simple this is and it it also write o here because it's now an ospf route right it again will write that it, it has a connected route also which is x dot x dot x dot x and which is reachable over fa 0 slash 0 towards here right suppose this is 0 slash 0 and you must be thinking that why i am explaining this these are all the basics but believe me guys uh sd van is all about learning basics first right and after some time i'll uh, i'll let you know that how we can uh, segment uh, uh, how we can separate these two things right so processor which which works on routing information make a meaningful information out of it and uh, which is your routing table right so routing table responsibility is that whatever whenever it receives a packet if there is a routing entry for it it will directly process the packet and send out to a particular interface outgoing interface right processor uh, uh, what processor do it takes all the meaningful information and help generating that routing table okay these two things are different now suppose a packet reaches at fa0/0 interface of this router r1 and the destination ip address is say y dot y dot y dot y simply it will go and check this routing table it will see that fa0 slash 1 is the outgoing interface and the packet will come out of this interface very simple right it even doesn't ask the processor what to do with it because we have everything here to switch that packet from fa0 slash 0 towards fa0 slash 1 right simple enough and suppose if, if this thing goes down again a router uh, this this route goes down again routers uh, two will send a lsa towards it towards r1 and processor comes to know that uh, y dot y dot y is gone this route is gone and that's why this thing uh, is this packet is not going to be forward this is simple right now can we separate route processor with route table to understand that sorry uh, route processor with route table so i am giving now them a different name right which you are comfortable with this portion is is control plane this portion of the router is data plane which actually deals with actual forwarding of data this is to build that capability through which data plane can work right so all the EIGRP, all the tables which are in which have you read in uh, your uh, uh, IGPs like interior gateway protocols, right? Uh, which is uh, EIGRP, topology table, OSPF database table, database, and RIP routing information. Anything should, uh, is 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 the responsibility of the control plane to process, and then data plane where we find the routing table. Okay, now how these control plane and data plane connected in a router these are connected with the cables right which we call bus i believe i am not sure about that but yes uh, those are connected with with some of the cables you cannot see them because those are inside the router okay now the question is can we separate control plane with data plane and the answer is yes but what benefits we get out of it right suppose we have 100 of routers right if I say that 100 of routers, all these 100 routers have their separate control plane and data plane, it means that most of the routers portion, a lot of the, lot of the uh, routers uh, processing power is going into processing these routing information, right? What, I, what if, if I say that I will move this control piece to somewhere else, to maybe three routers, right, which are powerful enough, right? To process all that information and previously they are connected uh, using bus now i connect with them with a simple cable so control plane and 
data plane is connected but now with the physical cables or maybe the maybe with the virtual links which we can form right the advantage is that it is easier to manage three routers control plane wise than to manage 100 routers right we can build policies here that what routes should go into these particular routers and this is going to be very very powerful and this is this exactly how sd wan is carrying its power of centralized policy don't uh, don't go with the terms I, and i'm extremely sorry that i took the name of centralized policy we will be discussing it later session but for now understand that control plane is totally different and data plane is totally different and it is possible to separate them we have just done that right because it is easier to manage control plane from few of the routers uh, if we compare it from uh, out of 100 routers and of course we will be using less uh, uh, cpu also okay so keep in uh, keep this one thing in your mind we have just uh, understood uh, uh, one of the pieces of that complete uh, sd wan solution how it works okay so now and the question is what else we need to learn the second thing is which is very common in uh, uh, routing understanding next hop right because there is a slightly different behavior we observe in bgp uh, when we deal with next hop so i would like to explain you here so uh, let's not consider first these three routers let's consider a case of uh, uh, simple routing where again we have these two routers r1 r2 which are connected directly and we have this one here x dot x dot x here y dot y dot y same thing again i am running uh, and suppose this ip address is 1.1.1.1 this ip address is 1.1.1.2 part of same network let's assume that so when r1 when we run ospf or any routing protocol rip over this link r1 will start advertising route towards r2 in routing table of r2 we will see that if you want to reach x dot x dot x dot x you can reach it over this interface maybe this is 0 slash 0 and the next hop for this packet is going to be 1 dot 1 dot 1 dot 1 right very simple you will see this in route 2 and if we are able to reach this next hop we can obviously forward this packet towards r1 and r1 will eventually forward this packet to uh, the actual host which, which poses this ip address right simple but can we change this next next hop ip address and if but if we can change then what is the use case of that right and that's why i have drawn this another picture right we have a service provider network here and this service provider network is attached with r1 uh, uh, means with with a uh, with an any enterprise which is xyz which is having its three routers r1 r2 r3 and those three routers are at different locations maybe this is somewhere in delhi this is in uh, mumbai and this is in bangalore right so all these routers can be reachable over these public IP addresses. It means that 1.1.1.3 can reach to 1.1.1 and 1.1.1.2 also. But now there is a limitation here, right? Uh, uh, if I have the direct reachability between these uh, subnets, I can run a routing protocol between these two IP addresses. Simple. I can run OSPF. Right? Company policy says that branches, these are the branches, can run routing protocol with only hub. Right? So we have one more OSPF pairing here or OSPF neighborship here. Right? But company says that you can't have a pairing between R2 and R3. What does that mean? This means that uh, this guy cannot be able to advertise this route directly to 1.1.1.2, right? Because there is no pairing. So let me remove this arrow. So if you consider uh, 
the routing table of R1, R1 will say, uh, you will see x dot x dot x dot x is reachable via R2 and y dot y dot y dot y is reachable via R3. Very simple. Similarly, if I go to R2, R2 will say, and now because there is no direct connectivity uh, in terms of OSPF pairing between R2 and R3, R2 will get both the routes, means X and, uh, means, uh, and suppose we have one another route here, say Z dot Z dot Z dot Z. So R2 will get both of these routes uh, via R1, right? And this way we are actually creating the hub and spoke topology. So here you go. So R2 will say that to reach Y dot Y dot Y dot Y, I need to go via R1. And, so, and easy, this is easy enough that X dot X dot X is, uh, it can reach via R1, right? But think of a case. Uh, now, uh, basically the traffic pattern between R1 and uh, R2 and R3 should be, uh, okay, sorry for this. The traffic pattern between R2 and R3 is going to be like this. Right, but what if if I want to reach directly between R2 and R3? I do not want to go, go via hub. Right? Policies only policy only say that you need you can make OSPF connection directly with R1, all the branches. But it doesn't say it doesn't say that you cannot send traffic directly. Right? But the problem is my next hop for this route y dot y dot y dot y is always this. R1, and that is why I will be sending first the traffic towards R1, and eventually R1 will be advertised to R3, right? Wouldn't it be nice that if R1, while advertising these routes to R2, change the next hop to R3 instead of its own, right? So it would be really better if we can reach this y dot y dot y, not from R1, but directly to R3. And believe me, the BGP has that capability. The OMP has that capability, which is run in the SD-WAN solution. That if you learn this out from R3, instead of saying that you can reach it uh, to R1, you can directly change it, this R1 value to R3. Now, R2 knows that if, he, if it wants to reach to this guy, right? it can directly reach it over the IP address of this R3 and the traffic pattern is going to be like this directly to service provider network. It doesn't have to go to R1. But you must be thinking that why? Why basically uh, <coughs> I'm not making pairing of this OSPF uh, between these two devices also, right? So here is the problem also. Suppose right now there is only three devices, right? And if you make uh, OSP pairing between each of them, you would need only three pairings, right? Consider a case where we have 100 of such spoke sites or 100 of uh, such sites in a particular organization. What you would like to have, uh, you, would you like to have uh, so many OSPF neighborship? If I calculate, uh, how many neighborship you will require? The formula is simple, n into n minus one by two, which is 100, 100 minus one by two, right? Is it going to be uh, 50 into 99, which is too much to process for anybody, right? So that's why basically we try to make minimum neighborship, and that's what we are doing. If we have, say, 100 more routers also, they need to just peer with R1. They don't need to peer, but if they are peering with uh, uh, with the hub, it doesn't mean that they cannot send traffic directly. They can send traffic tra directly if R1 can change the next hub, right? And we can change the next hub. But in plain, simple interior gateway protocol like EIGRP, OSPF, I'm not sure how to do that, but yes, there are some mechanisms, right? But by default, Whenever you receive a route, you set the next hop to the router which sent you that route, okay? It is simple. So we have, till now we have completed two 
pieces of a big puzzle now let's understand the third one which is going to be again very interesting the tunnel part right now let's try to understand what is a tunnel right and uh, i have mentioned that i have made a video of underlay and overlay uh, please go through it because i cannot spend much time here because i need to combine everything together also but we will we'll try to take a packet walk that actually whatever we means what we call as a tunnel is actually actually a tunnel or simple ip packet right so uh, consider a network where we have three router attached to internet right r1 r2 r3 and these two routers have uh, their respected lan side network so first of all we will talk about r1 and r2 how we can uh, make sure uh, because uh, you, you can see now there are many internet routers in between this r1 and r2 is not directly con uh, attached we haven't taken services of service provider uh, to build a direct lease line between r2 and r1 and r2 so there is uh, there are lot many guys over internet lot many routers over internet uh, through which your traffic is going to be passed right but can i simulate everything with this single lease line environment and yes i can simulate that right so right now and what i need for that is i need just the connectivity of this ip address with this ip address and that is it if i have if internet has provided me the connectivity between 1.1.1.1/24 and 1.1.2.24 Two dot slash twenty four. Then basically, I can be able to form a tunnel. And I have mentioned these subnets incorrectly, guys, because this could not be part of the same subnet. So say this is two dot two dot two dot two slash twenty four. My mistake. It is three dot three dot three dot three slash twenty four. And maybe this is this is a question for you that why it can't be like this way. right because we are talking about internet where every segment is different right and it should be different otherwise uh, we cannot reach it so <clears throat> so if this guy has a reachability 1.1.1.1 has a reachability to 2.2.2.2 we can form a lease line experience out of it right so how we can form that uh, i am drawing that from so i am drawing from here to here so basically this is not the real thing right this is the virtual thing which we have formed over the entire physical network and that's why we call this physical network as underlay and this tunnel which we form this this is uh, this so called tunnel which we form as overlay so this is the overlay right now i can easily run my routing protocol but to run that routing protocol i need to first assign this new tunnel or this new link ip address right you can always argue with me that why can't we use that 1.1.1.1 on this tunnel also we cannot use it because this is for the physical routing now we are looking for the virtual routing right uh, now we uh, the aim is that we need to send this route into the routing table of r2 and that's why we have built this link right so suppose this link name is channel 0 here also this link name is channel 0 and i configure an ip address over it 192.168.1.1 and here it is 192.168.1.2 and now these two can be on the same subnet and the reason is because these are directly connected virtual link right so if i run ospf bgp eigrp over it the router 2 will get to learn that x dot x dot x dot x is reachable via 192.168.1.1 which is the next hop and with uh, what is going to be the outgoing interface the outgoing interface is going to be channel 0 similarly r1 will be learning this out from R2 tunnel interface. Uh, so it will say 
this is the ospf route this is going to be ospf route y dot y dot y dot y is going to be learned over 192.168.1.2 which is the ip address of this tunnel and the outgoing interface is going to be tunnel zero simple now let's draw the packet because packet drawing is really really important in this case right so suppose this guy x dot x dot x wants to talk to uh, this guy which is y dot y dot y here right so uh, suppose there is a uh, uh, suppose there is a uh, laptop here which wants to talk to a laptop here and i have assigned an ip address in the range of x dot x dot x dot zero so the initial packet the how the ip packet will look which is created by this host or the laptop the source of this ip address is going to be x dot x dot x dot x and the destination is going to be y dot y dot y dot y right because this is a gre tunnel and uh, okay uh, this is a gre tunnel this packet is be given a special treatment and we will put some information which we call the gre header information don't worry about it for now right but this packet cannot go outside because uh, 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 with the same ip addressing right because this is this is uh, 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 at r1 basically the ip address is 1.1.1 the communication can happen between 1.1.1.1 and 2.2.2.2 right it is simple because these these guys are virtual right now r1 will see into its uh, uh, routing table it will find that to reach y.y.y.y dot 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 i need to go via 192.168.1.2 which is the ip address of tunnel 0 right so now it is really interesting that uh, router 1 knows that if we want to send this packet towards R2, it eventually needs to send this packet to 2.2.2.2. And they know that the endpoint of this tunnel, although the IP address, virtual IP addresses are this, but the real IP address is this. So what actually happened? This entire packet is encapsulated in another IP packet whose source will be 1.1.1.1 and destination is going to be 2.2.2.2 right this is the final ip packet which is actually coming out and for internet router this is any other normal packet right when it reaches there r2 will know that it's a gre packet right it decapsulated it will eventually find this packet which is going to be forwarded over this thing right very simple but you can argue with me again that why basically you are not changing everything into this original IP packet. If I done so, if I change a parameter of an IP packet, right? It means that IP packet definition is changed, which is not known by these internet routers. And if if these router doesn't understand this IP packet, they will it will simply drop it, right? That's why you put this thing source IP, uh, actual source IP and destination IP, then you put some information so that this router knows that this is a GRE packet. I need to in decapsulate it, right? And then you encapsulate it into another packet. And that's why you say tunnel, because your packet is tunneled into this outer packet. Your actual packet is going to be tunneled into this outer packet, right? Very simple. Now the question comes, if I send this, if I send this in plain text, would not be there are chances of uh, someone who is on internet which can take which, which can see the content of this packet and yes absolutely gre is not a secure protocol it sends everything in plain text right so that's that is where ipsec come into picture right so suppose this was your inner packet which was having x dot x dot x dot x as a source and y dot y dot y dot y as a destination. So what IPsec is going to do, IPsec will encrypt this information, right? And put its own header, let's say, which is IPsec header. We have GRE also. And then we have 
outer packet which is source 1.1.1.1 destination 2.2.2.2 right now if someone it's a normal ip packet these the outer packet is, is not encrypted only the inner packet is encrypted right although there are many ways in gre ipsec i sorry ipsec where you can encapsulate only header or any trailer or basically uh, entire packet whatever you would like to but we are not going into nitty gritties because we will be discussing the security aspects of sd1 or security there are going to be sessions dedicated to security uh, uh, so we are not going right now into the nitty gritties of ipsec but for now just understand that this guy and this guy is encrypted now internet will see this packet but the content of packet will be this one right nobody is going to read it unless they have the keys through which you have encrypted this packet right your communication is secure and believe me guys sd1 is also doing this they are building an ipsec channel ipsec point to point uh, ipsec channel and then basically they send data over it right but how they are doing it how it is changed we are going to learn in other section so till now we have understand control plane data plane and some part of uh, this thing which is uh, channel i forgot to mention one more thing that we have router 3 also here and why i have put this router 3 here, here is a specific reason for this so as r1 can make a r2 uh, can make a tunnel out of r2 uh, over this internet r1 can also make tunnel between r3 but consider that if these are going to be different point to point tunnels then we need to make as many as, uh, as tunnel as we have these routers so if there are 100 routers we need this r1 the hub site needs to have 100 virtual tunnels which means that there is going to be lot of load on this router r1 so there is a technology which we call it point to multi point right so this single point we can initiate multiple tunnels right so with this single point itself there is a tunnels towards r3 so r1 is only managing simple one multi point tunnel for this guy this is a is a point to point tunnel right simple but now as you can see that r2 can talk to r1 r1 can talk to r3 can uh, uh, and basically they can run ospf over it so we have the similar situation like previous that we have direct link between r1 and r2 r3 r1 and r2 and r1 and r3 in the form of in the form of uh, uh, this gre tunnels once we have that we can run ospf out, out of it to exchange these routes the idea is same right uh, and and to minimize the peering minimize the uh, ospf peering we are just peering with r1 r2 and r3 is not going to be peer and that is where the next stop comes into picture when r1 advertised this route towards r3 it will change its next stop and it will say that if you want to reach y dot y dot y dot y you can reach it directly it will change it from r1 to r2 which we explained which we just explained in the previous section right so that way basically when uh, when r3 wants to transfer some data to r2 it can make direct tunnel it doesn't have to go with r1 r2 and r3 and the beauty of this solution is that we don't have to peer with everybody right osp osp peering is not needed for every everybody and we can make this tunnel whenever we require because the destination r2 address is informed us by this r1 right if it if it is looking heavy for you uh, i would say uh, i will send the recording also guys just go through it once again whenever you have time but these three concepts control plane control plane data plane uh, then tunneling and the routing part which is especially the next stop routing is going to be very very important in understanding the complete picture of sd1 solution i hope 
uh, till now we are good and let's see uh, let's just my keep alive also uh, uh, rohit and saurav am i audible am i still audible yes vishnu just just quick question i think radhika wants to want you to repeat the traffic flow uh, like how r2 and r3 can communicate uh, without reaching r1 without reaching r1 so yeah, uh, who has asked this question uh, radhika okay so radhika it's a good question uh, as i mentioned that uh, you will be you will be uh, pre convinced with me that r1 will get this out r1 will get the route uh, to reach y dot y dot y dot y via r2 this guy right over this tunnel it's a simple routing it will get it when it advertises this route towards r3 right it will change this next stop right in simple terms when it advertise it towards r3 the route will look like this if you want to reach y dot y dot y reach via r1 because r1 is advertising it correct but now r1 has the capability to change this route it can easily say that y dot y dot y dot y should be reachable to r2 then the question is that whether r3 can reach to r2 and of course it can because everything is connected over internet 3.3.3.3 is reachable to 2.2.2 over internet if i am saying y dot y dot y is reachable over r2 it means that to reach to y dot y dot y i need to send packet towards 2.2.2 okay so here this packet the source ip address will be 3 and the destination ip address is going to be 2.2.2.2 but yes how they are getting 2.2.2 out of this it's slightly uh, uh it, it requires some time to understand because there is a protocol which comes into picture but let's not go deeper into that but for now try to understand this that this guy has the capability to change the next hop instead of saying that you can reach subnets after r2 with me it will say go and make a direct tunnel towards it it's as simple as that okay so up any uh, so uh, although there is uh, there is another topic which i want to cover now and uh, guys uh, especially attendees if you have some specific questions and you want them answer to be uh, means uh, live answer for that just be on this call even after 3 o'clock i will be spending around 15 minutes here to answer your queries but now let's combine all the learning and see how actually things are working right but before that uh, saurav rohit is there any uh, question which i can take right now which could be complete in say one or two minutes yeah yeah i think uh, satish govinda swami has asked uh, next stop do we need to use bgp that's the question by him uh, bgp uh, <clears throat> is a protocol which which basically tweaks uh, next stop right and it it is a totally separate topic but yes uh, bgp is the protocol where we have seen these next stop things changing right but don't worry we will be uh, as as even protocol uh, sorry as even solution doesn't use bgp it has its own protocol like uh, which is omp we will go into the identities of omp also which is all almost similar like bgp so don't worry about it anything else sort of no i think we can take that uh, after 3 pm okay yeah. after that 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 that's great so now uh, this is going to be interesting now let's combine all of them so that we have a complete picture of the solution so for that i have uh, these uh, this is suppose my hub site of my organization or say and and mostly we make data center as hub site here is a branch maybe this might be the mumbai branch and this is the bangalore branch now here we have put another device and i have named it as a smart device because it is actually smart right why previously uh, if i uh, and i am skipping all those things so suppose we have x dot x dot x dot x here subnet and we have say 
y dot y dot y dot y subnet here and we have here z dot z dot z zero slash twenty four. So instead of making OSPF for BGP neighborship to this guy, to this guy directly over this uh, to to DC or data center, I am not making that neighborship with hub side. Right, I am just completely eliminating it from the data path. So what I am doing right now is, first of all, this smart device, which is also connected to internet, I make a connection towards itself. And your hub also makes a connection towards itself. Sorry, to this device. This device, which I call the smart device, right? And these tunnels, basically, I call them as control plane tunnels. And in the solution, also, you will see the control tunnels, right? So this is somewhat different than IPsec, right? Uh, and do not worry about it. But for now, just try to uh, understand in, in this way that there is a direct virtual link between all the branches, data centers, and this is smart device. A smart device, uh, and there is, a, there is no full mesh connectivity, right? In terms of this, uh, in terms of this link, what I am doing is, I am making a tunnel from data center to smart device, from branches to smart device. Okay. Now, what I can do now is, I can run my routing protocol here. Actually, some, somebody has asked the question that why do we need a tunnel, right? In this case, we need a tunnel because these guys are not directly connected. And if you want to run a routing protocol, these guys need to be connected. So please, if you are not getting it, please go through the recording, which I, which I will be going to send. Please, please understand all these concepts. Otherwise, the next sessions are almost impossible for to understand. So I would suggest, uh, without wasting time, uh, let me complete this, and I will answer after some time. So here, uh, uh, this data center uh, is basically uh, connected over this virtual link to the smart device, and we are running routing protocol now over this green virtual link. Everything is simple, right? Now, this is smart device. Now, smart device will learn that if you want to reach x dot x dot x dot x, you can reach it via data center router. If you want to reach, oh, sorry, uh, you can reach it uh, via branch one, correct? If you want to reach y dot y dot y dot y, you can reach via BR2. And if you want to reach z dot z dot z dot z, you can have it via data center router. This is very uh, simple because you have run routing protocol over this thing, and that's why all of your routers, data center router, branch routers, are exchanging their route. And it doesn't matter which routing protocol you learn, run. You can run BGP, you can run EIGIP, whatever you would like to. But LT1 solution has its own protocol, which is OMP which is a stripped down version, I would say, of PGP. Okay? So don't worry about it. But for now, just try to understand that the smart device has a complete picture of your organization, right? Because it has all the necessary routes. Now, what it can do is, whatever route it is learning, it can advertise them, right? It can advertise them to every other device so that everyone has the full reachability, right? So if you consider this DC will be having routes that if you want to reach y dot y dot y dot y, you can reach it via branch one. And the important thing is this smart device is not saying that you can reach branch one can reach data center via me. So it means that this smart device is not at all in the data path, right? It is just 
working on route details it is just working on the information sent by these device so can i consider this as a control plane right because now there is the responsibility of processing the individual routing information has been shifted from these edges or these routers to a central controller which is a smart device right so dc will see that y dot y dot y dot y can we reach via br1 i am sorry br2 z dot x dot x dot x dot x is reachable via br1 similarly branch 1 will say that z dot z dot z dot z is reachable via dc and y dot y dot y dot y is reachable directly via here also and if we have this then why can't we create a direct connection between them now so this was the control connection right where we are exchanging routing information once we have exchanged the routing information once we have everything in place and suppose now here is a computer which wants to connect to the branch to computer here it knows that if we want to reach to y dot y dot y dot y it needs to go to br2 and that is where the next tunnel come into picture they will form a direct tunnel now right which we call as data tunnel simple because branch 1 has all the information to route the traffic towards y dot y and how it getting all this information from this smart device and once is that all this information it doesn't need any control plane it just need to send this data out of this tunnel and that's why they make this data tunnel right guys believe me this is what actually sd wan is doing and yes these data tunnels are automatically formed you do not need to even define this control tunnels also it will all uh, automatically form also right i would really suggest this time guys just go through this recording otherwise next questions next sessions are going to be very difficult for the understanding these are very very basics and uh, just go through recording uh, if you don't understand anything is everything is there and and still if you have problem just to shoot your question right so the next 10 15 minutes i am here uh, uh saurabh and rohit if you feel that there is a question we can answer right now please uh, do ask okay so now i can uh, also read the question so there is a question will the tunnel between the smart device and other devices needs to be configured manually no as given solution has the provision that it will be forming automatically this was the question of uh, abhay nagar and thanks for the question now uh, there is a question from dhawal patel the data tunnels are formed straight after the control planes are formed or only when interested traffic hits any router or the, uh, then the data tunnels will be formed in the given solution basically if they have a path to reach the remote Uh, device they form that tunnel so and that is basically it is different from normal dmvpn solution they form the tunnel directly without basically any interesting traffic so the tunnel is whenever they have uh, the information about the remote edge they will form a tunnel towards uh, for how long okay uh, for how long the data tunnel remains on the edges after first time trading there is there for all the time whenever there is a, till till the reachability right if there is no reachability no tunnel if there is a reachability tunnel is going to be there but yes you can tweak this full mesh behavior right you can it is not the case that you cannot tweak it uh, the full mesh full meshing of tunnels you can you tweak it pretty easily you can make hub and spoke or any topology whatever you would like to how to use as even in real time environment how it will replace the question is from rahul how it will replace existing network what is zero uh, provisioning we will be answering that in, in in remaining sessions don't worry rahul 
how control planes are formed automatically if they uh, ha this is the interesting question from sri naga and we will be discussing that in coming session so this is where basically actually the authentication part comes into picture certificates and other things we will be discussing them in the later section can we explicitly remove any tunnel that got created automatically yes we can and this is the rule of centralized policies in sg wan from shivam is there uh, is there in any limitation of tunnel count in sg wan blocks uh, it depends on box to box and you can go and always check about the capability of, of a particular uh, box lijesh oh he is just appreciating for the wonderful session and i i really uh, uh, thank you guys for this also <laughs> also like the way you name v smart as uh, a smart device <laughs> and yes it is actually a smart device and that's why it's v smart so uh, binumath is asking uh, actually yeah hi um, hi Ushma, yeah. i had a question can you please share that last uh, um uh, uh, i think slide number 5 uh where you were explaining the complete yeah, solution it is it is right uh, here yeah so i just want to confirm my understanding so so we will not be having any gre or ipsec tunnels formed directly between uh, the branch routers or between br1 and dc um uh, like the way initially no, no, you explained uh, once, that, once that is not there. okay no 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 we know once yeah. this is smart device forward all the routing information to br1 and br2 automatically create that data tunnel because br1 has right, right. right? yeah so yeah it, i understood so i'm just okay. uh, trying to confirm my understanding so okay there sure. won't be any any uh, gre tunnel formed between br1 and dc in the control plane to exchange routes rather the routes uh, you know whatever routes are there on the dc or on the br1 those actually get exchanged to the smart device mm -hmm. uh, over the tunnel that is formed between the smart device and each of these uh, nodes uh, the smart device would know which node has what route and then it would propagate to each of those individual individual nodes um, that's how for example br1 would know that 2.z.z.z.0 dot z dot z dot z dot is connected to data center and smart device would uh, also let br1 know uh, that to reach z dot z dot z dot 0 uh, the next stop would be uh, data centers wan ip yes is this, your understanding correct. is absolutely correct just keep in mind that a smart device is smart enough that he doesn't say that you can reach it via me he say you can go and directly reach right and that yeah, is why yeah. it's okay so yeah. this is now this uh -huh, go ahead yeah so so this this particular uh, tunnel that is formed between smart device and uh, uh, the respective nodes i understand that it is using something called omt as a protocol over it but for the tunnel formation itself is it a gre tunnel or no this is slightly different and we are going to discuss it uh, okay. you know this okay. is tls and dtls and believe okay. me i do not want to go into the terminology because no, no, no. this is confuse people we will understand tls we will under understand dtls right in the security sessions but right now just assume these are the tunnels just like the data yeah. tunnel but the technology could be different for yellow we are using ipsec for green we are using uh, tls ctls and that is it okay. so there was okay. some uh, there, there was a question from somebody that which one is the best as given solution right and this question is from rahul rahul cisco definitely cisco is having the best uh, uh, as given solution okay Yeah, and Vishnu, there's one last question to finish that thing. Uh, uh, hello, Vishnu, can you hear me? Yeah, I I can hear you, Pinu. Uh, yeah. So uh, once this uh, control plane routing information is exchanged, suppose that there is a data tunnel uh, formed um, automatically. So mm -hmm. I just want to understand. So um, once this is exchanged, uh, the next stop, what the smart device would be. giving the respective nodes is the wan ip right so what is the actual need for having a tunnel uh, because those are not directly connected but we are not it's in the data plane right we are not going to have any control plane uh, formed between 
the the nodes right yeah i understood your uh, your concern and believe me uh, we are going to discuss in probably tomorrow or day after tomorrow okay, but your okay. question is valid right? right and there is a proper reason <laughs> otherwise see these developers these solutions maker doesn't do a single thing if if it if it if it doesn't make sense right correct so correct. the things are working there must be a logical reason and and you will be get because otherwise the next session topic we we are going to discuss here but your question is really valid very good and we are going to explain this in coming session okay so uh, thanks for the great session thank you here looks like dc is also one of the spoke like branch do we still need high end boxes for dc so uh, you are right that basically dc is looking like a branch here but it is not the uh, it is not the case that you want the full mesh connectivity between any to any right and most of the organization uh, doesn't want the full mesh connectivity right so that's why basically but you can build a full mesh, uh, a custom topology out of full mesh uh, topology because everything is connected to everything if you want to make a custom topology or ruben spoke topology you can and this is where this v smart comes into picture it will advertise the route only to the devices uh, in accordance with your uh, uh, policies suppose you want to make hub and spoke to, uh, policy all the branches will uh, all the branches the uh, routes can be uh, forwarded to a data center or the basically hub but hub will be transmitting only the default route towards the branches so the question is good Uh, there is a question from ajit what is the smart devices uh, what is the smart devices goes down do the edge remains yes the edge remains active for a considerable period of time and we will be discussing that uh, uh, this is the graceful uh, timer uh, we can configure so yes uh, but they can stop. but we will be discussing it in greater detail in case there is uh, so sarav is asking one question in case there is a disconnection between uh, smart device and branch device which branch do uh, able if there is a disconnection between a smart device yes yes it's the same question uh, sir so we will we can be discussing it later also don't worry okay but yes you have for the and the answer for your question is yes they can mayank that, that was a question from kaushik oh okay okay sorry 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 no problem okay so the question is from mayank anand what would be the packet format and flow if we change our network from legacy to sd wan this performance impact yeah we will be discussing that those are slightly advanced topics man and we will be working towards it but i am really really happy to see that and and people are really really showing interest into these sessions uh, uh, just post your questions just email me just uh, send me over the links and uh, uh, it it was really nice to have you all uh, so i got one more question why are the logical address not taken into consideration in packet structure after gre encapsulation yes there is a logical answer for that uh, but uh, uh, but but you are actually transmitting packets between uh, between the physical addresses right and as i mentioned in, in in the session itself that there is another protocol which we called uh, next hop reachability protocol nhrp which actually resolves such kind of issues right from from your virtual ip addressing to the physical ip addressing so let's not go deeper into that but if you really want to understand gre just have a look gre or any multi point tunnel uh, just have a look uh, for more documentation and maybe we can discuss the uh, uh, um, this uh, when all this session gets completed so from abenagar uh, there is a question will the smart device be residing in the campus or will it be on cloud it is up to you basically if you say that it should be in my enterprise data center you can place it there but cisco recommended model is that you, uh, these devices need to be on cloud and cisco is going to manage them now there is a question from pradeep ram uh, ramani uh, if there if every router has all the routes from all the spokes then the branch routers would not be overutilized in terms of data plane uh, we need to have uh, uh, the tunnels to every other uh, edges if you want to control them then there is a provision for that using centralized policy we will be discussing that like how like the how data plane uh, tunnels created uh, dynamically is control plane tunnels created is required or we will be discussing it in the coming uh, sessions and the one is saying thank you for the session thank you for attending it the one uh, 
another question suppose if the uh, uh, smart router lost its connection we, we have already answered it yes the tunnels are going to be persist for a considerable time of a period of time we will be discussing them uh, later also anybody else okay uh, fine guys uh, i think this is the time to finish the session now thank you very much for attending this and uh, let's meet in tomorrow's bye for now have a nice day ahead